Today's screencast is all about bonding definitions. Um, some things that we will be going over in the screencast are primary bonding, secondary bonding, properties related to bonding, and the coefficient of thermal expansion. So, if there's a particular definition that you wish to see, there is a whole bunch of hyperlinks down here, and click on the one that you want. Also, this is more of an overview. It does not go very in-depth into bonding, so if you would like a more in-depth version of this. There is another separate bo bonding concepts muddiest point video which is the link is right here. So let's get down to business. Primary bonding is defined as bonds whose bonding energies are large and have strong interatomic bonds. There are three types of primary bonding one ionic, two covalent, and three metallic. Um, if this entire thing about bonding energy is a little bit foggy to you, there is a separate video all about bonding energy and energy wells and how to read those kinds of graphs, and that link is right there. So, let's go on to the three types of bonding. I, a covalent bond is a sharing of electrons between two or more atoms. Here we have methane, and we can see that carbon shares each of its four valence electrons with four hydrogens, which also share their single valence electron to make it so that carbon has eight and each of the hydrogen has two, so they're all happy and their valence shells are filled. Here we have a picture of a diamond, and diamond is also covalently bonded. Now, in methane we have 0d covalent bonding and in diamond we have 3d covalent bonding. So if you want to know more about the dimensions and what happens with those for covalent bonding you should check out this other video, the muddiest point bonding video right up here and that has a more in-depth version of covalent bonding. So our next type of bonding is ionic bonding and that involves a transfer of electrons from two oppositely charged ions. Here we have sodium chloride or table salt. We have sodium here becoming sodium plus one and chlorine becoming chlorine minus one. So what happens is the sodium donates a, an electron to the chlorine like so and so they become oppositely charged ions and then the attraction between them connects them is what holds the bond together. So. Remember to repeat, it is a transfer. That is the most important part of this. Transfer. Ionic bonds equals a transfer of electrons. All right. Our third type of primary bonding is metallic bonding. Now, metallic bonds are defined as the mutually shared delocalized valence electrons by all the atoms in a metal. So that's not very clear. So basically what happens is all of the metal atoms donate their electrons to a common C and so the electrons are no longer attached to any one of the metal cations, so now they're, all the metal cores are positively charged. And so it is just this kind of electron glue kind of sort of that holds the entire thing together. So again, if you want a more in-depth version of a metallic bonding that go, has you know a bigger picture and just better descriptions, go to this video up here. It's also good to note uh, which type of materials have you know, covalent ionic and metallic bonds. So ceramics have either covalent bond, 3D covalent bonding, or ionic bonding. So that would be ceramics. And ceramics have this too. However, polymers also have covalent bonding, but polymers have 1D covalent bonding. So they have 1D covalent bonding. And as the name would suggest, metallic bonding is found in metals. So again, if you want a more in-depth version of the whole how does bond strength relate to the properties of the material types, go to this link up there. Now before we start talking about secondary bonding, we should probably go over dipoles and what it means to be a polar molecule because a lot of times these are what cause the secondary bonding in a material. So 
A dipole is a separation of positive and negative charges and it is caused by unbalanced electron clouds. Now there are two types of dipoles or basically two t ways that the electron clouds can be imbalanced. They can they have temporary dipoles and permanent dipoles. So in temporary dipoles you have a momentary attraction or repulsion between two polar molecules and so these m molecules aren't always polar. Uh, and in a um, permanent dipole you have a slightly stronger attraction or repulsion force that temporary di than temporary dipoles between two polar molecules. So the the molecules are always polar in this case. So, and then to go on, what is a polar molecule? A polar molecule is a molecule that has a non-zero permanent or temporary dipole moment. Well, basically it has an unbalanced electron cloud. So half the molecule is, has like a slightly negative charge and half the molecule has a slightly positive charge over there. So again, this was a very, very quick overview of dipoles and polar molecules. So I go into a lot more depth in this video up here. So if it's confusing to you, please watch it. So now that we know all about polar molecules and dipoles, we can now talk about secondary bonding. There are two t main types of secondary bonding, Van der Waals bonding and hydrogen bonding. But secondary bonding is defined as van der Waals and hydrogen bonding whose bonding energies and interatomic strengths are smaller and weaker than the primary bonds, which I think the fact that they are smaller and weaker is the most important aspect of these secondary bonds. Um, I'd also like to point out that they are caused by dipoles interactions and those dipoles can either be permanent or temporary. And as stated previously, the permanent dipoles have a stronger secondary bonding than the temporary dipoles. So in van der Waals bonding, we have a secondary interatomic bond between neighboring atomic or molecular dipoles, permanent or temporary. Van der Waals bonds are what causes the awesome properties of polymers. Polymers have a low stiffness, low melting point, but high coefficient of thermal expansion, and the van der Waals bonds cause that because they are what keeps the material together. We have the 1D covalently bonded chains right there, and then we have van der Waals bonding between the chains holding it together, and that's why the van der Waals bonds are responsible for the properties of polymers. So if you want more in depth, visit that video. We have a whole section about bond van der Waals bonding in polymers. The other type of secondary bonding that we're going to talk about today is hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is defined as the bonding of hydrogen atoms to the most electronegative atom in the molecule, but this doesn't really describe the intermolecular interactions of the hydrogen with that electronegative element. So we have a picture of water right here, two water molecules. We have right here the hydrogen which both have a slightly positive charge and the oxygen which has a slightly negative charge but the separation of this in, in this molecule between the partially positive and partially negative is much greater than in a normal temporary or permanent dipole that's why it's classified as its own separate entity so we can see that the partially positive hydrogen interacts with this other slightly negative oxygen and forms a bond, again not as strong as a primary bond, but it is stronger than other van der Waals bonds or intermolecular interactions. So the strength of hydrogen bonds is what accounts for the interesting properties of water, such as its high surface tension and high boiling point. Also other elements that could be bonded to this hydrogen other than oxygen that would make hydrogen bonds between the molecules would be something like nitrogen or fluorine. Now that we know all about the different types of bonding, we can now talk about the three properties that are directly related to a material's type of bonding. Those properties are thermal expansion, melting point, and modulus of elasticity. Now, Thermal expansion is the change in length as thermal energy is either added or released to a material. 
the material with the stronger bonding will not expand as much as a material with weaker bonding when the same amount of thermal energy is applied. So from this, we can look at this diagram here. We see that both of these materials, tungsten and aluminum, were raised the same amount of degrees, so 500 degrees Celsius, but the tungsten rod did not expand as much as the aluminum rod. So from this, we can say that tungsten has a higher bond strength than aluminum. All right, our next property is the melting point. It is the temperature at which the material changes physical states from solid to liquid. General trend is that when the bonding strength of a pure metal is stronger, the melting point is at a higher temperature. So, changes physical states from solid to liquid. And as a fun fact, tungsten has the highest melting point. It's used in light bulbs as shown here. The third properly related to bonding is the modulus of elasticity, or E. It's also called Young's modulus. It is the stiffness of the material when the material is undergoing deformation, specifically elastic deformation. The stronger the bond, the stiffer the material. Now, right now all you need to know that it is a measure of stiffness, however, we have two videos about the tensile test that go over modulus of elasticity in a lot more detail, and those links are over here. So, just to sum summarize, as the bond strength goes up, the coefficient of thermal expansion, or thermal expansion in general, will just go down. Um, as bond strength goes up, the melting point will also go up. And finally, as bond strength goes up, so does the modulus of elasticity. The coefficient of thermal expansion is one of the three properties of a material that is directly related to the type of bonding that it has, but it's a little bit tricky to understand what it is. So what it is, is a rate of change of length of a material with temperature change. So it is represented by an alpha, and here is how you would mathematically solve for it. However, I don't like how that's written, so I'm going to rewrite it a new way. So. If we do it this way, we can see that it is the change in length divided by the change in temperature times 1 over the original length. Another way to say this would be the fractional change in length per degree of temperature change. Right. And looking at this, we can easily see how this could become a calculus problem. Right. DL, DT. Right. However, we're not going to do calculus today. In fact, we're going to assume that DLDT is linear for our purposes in an intro materials class. Also, we're going to assume that we're working with solids, because if we were not working with solids, we'd have to involve pressure into this equation somehow, and that's just not really applicable to material science as much as with solids. So, in an intro materials class, you're probably going to use this equation more often than this one up here. So and a lot of times you'll probably be given like four of the things and you'd have to be solving for the fifth one, right? So let's do a sample calculation. Here, let's pretend our original length is five centimeters. Our change in length is one centimeter and our ch change in temperature, change in temperature is equal to 500 degrees Celsius. So it doesn't matter where you start or where you ended, it's just the change in temperature is 500 degrees Celsius. So doing the calculation, we can see that using this equation, because that's a little bit easier, even though this one will get you the same thing, um, we can see that our change in length would be one centimeter, our original length would be five centimeters, which would be equal to alpha, times our change in temperature, which again was 500 degrees Celsius, and then working that out, dividing by 500 on both sides using a calculator, I'm sure you can do that, we will end up with alpha being 4 times 10 to the negative fourth equals alpha. So that's basically the extent of the math that most intro materials classes are going to make you do. They're not going to expect you, in most ones, to do calculus. So, what's important to note is that for a given change in temperature, the lower change in length divided by the original length means a lower alpha and higher bond strength. So, to put it in perspective, let's pretend we have two materials, number one and alpha two. We're given, this is one, 
that is 2. Let's just pretend our first alpha is, I don't know, 0.1, and our second alpha is 0 0.0002, okay? So we can tell just by, given, uh, by them giving us the coefficient of thermal expansion for two different materials, we can say that the bond strength of material 1 is less than the bond strength of material 2 because this material expands more when it is heated. So I hope that this clears up any confusion about some bonding concepts. Um, again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. We have another video about bonding up there in that corner. So thank you so much for watching and happy engineering.